All right, everyone, welcome to another week. Today, science fiction is going to become real. There are people out there working for us. And so I just want to say to all of our extended family, you're in the right place at the right time for the best of all concern. Welcome. Lisa, it's all yours. Thanks, Nick Finn. Welcome to Everything ALS Events. June is our Brain Computer Interface Series, and we're super excited to kick this off with Neuralink, which is a company founded by Elon Musk. We're going to take you today behind the curtains to witness the power of technology. So imagine your thoughts that could lead to action with the use of robots. It's pretty cool. So Everything ALS's mission is to back technology and AI for brain disease. We believe this will be a key to solving the living mystery behind neurodegenerative diseases. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Lisa Deegan, and I lost my younger brother, John, to ALS. I'm a co-founder of the nonprofit, Everything ALS, where we conduct studies on digital biomarkers. So please consider signing up for our speech study at everythingals.org forward slash forward slash research, um, because we're, we're revolutionizing the way that clinical trials are going to be conducted in ALS. I also want to mention today is the official Lou Gehrig's Day across Major League Baseball. It honors his legacy, and it's inspired the ongoing movement to help end ALS and raise awareness. So I'll put some details in the chat on how you can get involved and where you can donate to help in the fight against ALS. So tonight or today, depending on where you are, we have Neuralink um, here to show us their implantable brain machine interface and how it's gonna help people with paralysis to regain independence through the control of computers and mobile devices. The Neuralink team is here to tell us about their amazing innovative work, but also they wanna hear your feedback on what you would like to see for the future of BCI. So they're gonna present their solution and then later we're gonna open it up to Q&A so they can hear your thoughts and your questions. I'm excited to introduce our speakers. We have Dr. Jayanth Menon. He is a neurosurgeon, biomedical engineer, and clinical assistant professor of neurosurgery at Stanford. Christine Odovashian is a mechanical engineer. She leads the insertion hardware team, part of the sur surgical robotics at Neuralink. And also Kate Gelman, she's an electrical engineer and patient engagement team lead at Neuralink. So now please join me in welcoming Dr. Jayanth Menon. All right, thank you for, uh, for letting me know. Yeah, please please stop me at any point that I start uh, becoming unclear here. But um, yeah, I wanted to start by thanking you all for inviting us to, to this format um, and this forum to be able to share uh, a little bit about what we're working on. And, and I, I wanted to uh, yeah, I'll say again that our, our goal is to be of service uh, to, to you and your community. And um, we really value the opportunity to do this. It's, it really can't be underestimated or overestimated how much, how, much it's, um, how much it's going to impact what we do. We're trying to stay really close to and listen to uh, what you want and you meaning not only uh, people with motor impairment, but also in ALS, uh, but also their caregivers, because it takes a system of people to, to help each other out, and we hope to to play a small role in, in supporting that. Um, so uh, our team that's that's here is a really broad set of, uh, of experiences and skills, and and so uh, hopefully we'll be able to answer um, most, if not all, your questions. But uh, we'll be available afterwards too to. Uh, to interact with anyone who is uh, interested in chatting with us. Um, so uh, kind of our, our, our hopes today is to go over these three concepts. Uh, I'll be talking about brains and machines and hopefully be able to convey to you uh, something about the brain that you might already know, but perhaps uh, a way of looking at it uh, to, to understand how what we're talking about doing uh, isn't too different from what you're doing right now. And, uh, and we'll talk about the actual way that we're planning on uh, uh, delivering the care, uh, delivering this, this therapeutic to you. And, and finally talk about the, the patient engagement that we're hoping to 
continue our relationship with you um, to, to, to define. So, so far, let me just do a mic check. Everything going okay so far? Sounds great. Okay, great, thanks. All right, so, so yeah, the human brain. Uh, it's something I've spent uh, over 20 something years uh, pondering over and, and every day is a new, uh, a new mystery, a new challenge. And uh, so we, we think about the brain as this kind of golden object that's uh, uh, sitting atop uh, and, and kind of in control of, uh, of our hopes, our fears, our imaginations. And, and so the idea of uh, interfacing it somehow with the machine sounds really foreign. But um, the brain itself, you know, there are a lot of different ways people have talked about it and uh, what it is, what it isn't. Um, and we always kind of have this picture, right? We have on the left side, uh, your brain is this logical part that has a lot of uh, thought analysis, uh, speech, uh, and the right side has a lot of um, uh, a lot of things we talk about with artistry and, and music and appreciation. And uh, of course, the truth is uh, all of it does some components of all of those things. And that we, um, and not only is the brain, when you think about it, uh, the brain itself, it, it's, it's one part of a system. And that system actually involves every single part of your body. And every square centimeter of your skin is connected directly to this, uh, to, uh, to other parts uh, through this kind of central um, uh, processing area, but that the processing itself couldn't happen without those outside parts. So saying the brain is the center is, is at once true, but also doesn't encapsulate the entire fact of what it does. And, and basically, uh, we've kind of broadened our perspective. You can think of the brain as a mapping um, entity. So it uh, takes any sort of input and maps it to all sorts of outputs. And one way is, uh, and then the other part is it takes those outputs and, and perceives the output itself uh, as, as another sort of input, as another part of the, the input. So it's doing this in a closed loop fashion uh, all the time, even when you're asleep, um, even when you think you're not moving, it, uh, it's doing this uh, from the moment uh, you are conceived uh, and, and for all, all time, it's really doing this function. The brain itself doesn't see, your eyes uh, translate that uh, uh, the, the photons, single photons into a collection of signals that are processed at multiple layers and then recognized in different places and named in another place. Uh, and a decision is made to uh, send a, uh, a signal down to, a, to a, uh, an output mechanism. Uh, I say these things generally because there's a lot of different ways your body has output and all these things are integrated together to, and orchestrated at all these different levels from down in the individual organ all the way up to the kind of the parts that you've, you're conscious of. And so the, the parts that you're conscious of are just a small fraction of all the things that this, this really amazing system does. It's not just the brain itself. And so uh, it, you may, may know this already, but uh, we oftentimes think of ourselves having five senses, five major senses as inputs. But the truth is we have way more than five. There are all sorts of uh, senses being still investigated and found. So vision, smell, hearing, taste, and touch are the ones we think, oh yeah, the five major senses. They're the ones that you're kind of most conscious of if you, if you are, are, that are apparent to your experience most of the time, but so is this equilibroception, which is the idea of uh, being in balance. It's, uh, uh, you understand when you, when you lose this, uh, if you've ever engaged in some recreational alcohol use, you might've had a change in your equilibrium perception. And so something you can, uh, you can definitely tell uh, happens. A proprioception is a sense of uh, location of your body in space. So you always know where you are. And we know this from uh, when you take away gravity, for example, uh, or have certain kinds of conditions, your uh, actual sense of where your, or your, 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 your limbs are in space can, can change. And 
Uh, kinesthesia is the sense of movement. Uh, you all can tell when you're accelerating forward or backward or when your hand is moving uh, or, or part of your body is moving. Nociception is pain, so you can feel pain. It is a sense of its own with its own uh, mechanisms involved. Uh, chronoception is a passage of time. Uh, if you take someone and put them in a black box uh, in, a, in a cave down in the earth, uh, they will develop their own uh, circadian rhythm. So you'll know when to wake up, you'll go to sleep around the same time, and it's uh, genetically encoded. So it, it's animal stuff that goes down the insect level. We all have chronoception, and it, you cannot ignore this. Uh, it's one of those parts of, if you don't pay attention to your chronometer, your, your time measuring device, your brain will put you on the floor. You cannot uh, live without sleep. In fact, um, if you develop a disease of sleep, uh, there are some, there's, a, there's a condition called fatal familial insomnia where the young men can't fall asleep and it actually leads to death. So chronoception is critical to your well-being and, and, and life. Uh, interoception is a whole category of, of perceptions uh, from inside your own body. So you, when you're think about it, you can be aware of your heart rate, you can be aware of your gut moving around, um, and, and to the point where many of these can be mixed. So uh, there are some people who are, have synesthesia, so they see, and probably statistically speaking, that in the audience here, there are definitely some of you that can uh, hear colors or uh, see number, or uh, uh, feel numbers, uh, moods that are, that are changed, introception, that are mixed and those that's that's normal in in a group of people and and can lead to unlocking some really interesting um interesting uh phenomena any of you that have uh, in, engaged in uh, any lsd usage uh will know that this is this is part of and and actually what is a key part of that that experience is a synesthesia that happens with those medications those drugs you are able to connect uh, colors and sense and hearing together. And, and so that's that's the experience of a synesthetic person. On the other side, we talk about the outputs, right? So typically we think of these as muscle. So those are things, uh, not just the uh, big ones that help you move, but they're also uh, the smaller ones that help you speak. Uh, and we kind of broadly think of things that are under voluntary control, things that you consciously can choose to do and those that are involuntary. So your blood vessels, you can act, they actually change their diameter based on stress. Um, hair can, can stand up or down based on emotion even, uh, or an image. Uh, your heart rate uh, mostly is involuntary, but digestion and, and, and urinary excretion, these are all uh, output functions that your body and your brain are working really uh, closely together to, to accomplish all the time. Uh, and so the interesting thing is, uh, because a brain maps those inputs to those outputs, uh, there is right now we're, we're, uh, we, we can't, without taking some of these uh, interesting um, mind-altering substances, easily just turn some of that on or off. We can't take something that is a blood vessel and make that under conscious control. Although there are people who can. There are people who can uh, control their own heart rate with conscious control. You can learn how to do a lot of these different things. And that might be the other part of, of the brain that's so phenomenal is the fact that now that you know, even now that I've told you that you know about these different functions, uh, because it's entered your consciousness, uh, if, it's, if it's new to you, there's a possibility that you could control them um, through, through that same process of paying attention to it, attempting to control it. Um, and, and this is how we learn how to walk, this is how we learn how to write, but it's also how we can learn how to do amazing things like uh, fly airplanes or, or make robots. Um, and so uh, we know that there are some wiring diagrams to support the things we talked about. So, uh, so these are some of the senses on the left. It's complicated pictures that uh, I've spent an uh, inordinate amount of time trying to memorize, but I always am, am blown away by how much I don't know. Uh, and, and only a small amount of this do I actually get to operate on and to try to help people. Most of the time, uh, neurosurgery is about trying to not hurt these functions and, and doing my best to avoid them. On the right is the a, is a motor cortex and system that you're all probably very, uh, very familiar with. And this lateral corticospinal tract is a key part of the, uh, of the, of the condition you all live with and, and care for people 
uh, with. And so uh, th this is just one of many of those diagrams. And I say that because we're still discovering many of them and that these diagrams are much more complicated, closed loops and open loops than we ever knew before. So uh, this kind of gets to the point of like, okay, well, if you look at machines themselves uh, and the uh, computer scientists, and maybe some of you have even worked on these to make it, um, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but machines uh, do the same kind of function. Machines, when I think of the, the instrument that I'm talking through uh, to speak with you, all, all works on the same path. There's an input, uh, there is some sort of processing uh, or interpretation, judgment, and there's an output. Uh, typically, it's open loop, or it's usually the human sitting on, on one side looking at this thing and controlling it. And so uh, if you put this all together, you have your own control system that's, that's you know, your, your whole body and your brain being a part of it. There's an, uh, something you see, an intent, a decision you make, and a motor output, and let's say it uh, hits a mouse and it goes into the computer, and the computer performs an action on your behalf. And now we're living in this interesting world where these machines can do more and more on our behalf. Uh, you know, we're talking to each other in a pandemic. Uh, we're able to uh, care for each other. It's uh, and and we're able to, um, to to work on new ideas. And so the the challenge and and the opportunity right now is that um, for for many people for many reasons. Uh, uh, there's a preference not to use or inability to use some of those motor outputs that that are that one in that one picture I was talking about this corticospinal tract, and so particularly the the patients that we're uh, aiming our first uh, uh, assistive device towards are folks that have an impairment in this in this tract. So whether it's from a spinal cord injury or, or ALS or uh, any other neurodegenerative process or stroke. Uh, that there is a possibility uh, to, uh, to, to, to bypass the, the motor output and connect the, uh, on, on the output side, directly connect the, the second half of this picture. So this decision from the point you make a decision to the point you decide to do something, we can actually uh, listen to the signals of the brain, which are happening all the time. And and, and, and use those signals themselves to interact with the, the machines in our lives. So not just um, computers, but uh, cell phones, any, any uh, piece of hardware that can uh, have a command, which is almost all of them that we interact with. Um, so, uh, and, and in the future, uh, there are, uh, there's the input side uh, we, can, we can work on too. But uh, the story for today and the part that we'd like to communicate more details about is really focusing on this story of, uh, for this first uh, uh, trial where we're trying to show that this type of technology is safe and effective, um, is this device that um, we'll talk to you more about next. So I guess I'll pass the mic to uh, Christine and now, how do I do that? Uh, I can just talk if you want to okay. the next slide and, you know. And awesome. I'll do that. Work. I made her co-host, so she, everybody has the ability to share now, so we're good. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Cool. Um, all right, so this slide just gives a summary of, you know, where we are, where we came from, and where we're going. So. You guys uh, that are familiar with Neuralink might remember the first public release in 2019. We're a much smaller team then, and we were still working on uh, proving out like the preliminary uh, R&D hardware. And today we're working on preparing our current hardware, what we call the N1 implant and the R1 robot for IDE submission to start helping the first humans as soon as we possibly can with a device that we're confident is safe and effective. And uh, there's a lot of exciting ideas for where to go next, and you know, depending how far, uh, how far ahead you're thinking, you know, all the way to the ultimate goal of you know helping save humanity from the existential threat of a ambiguous future with where there's general AI, um, or to more near term, you know, once, uh, you know, we can look at motor, motor, sensory motor cortex uses, or you know, anything that the brain controls, maybe we can. Um, help afflictions with using our implant. 
So here's a picture of the surgical robot. And in the next slides, I'll talk about um, why we even want to bother with a surgical robot. Anytime you develop a robot, it you know, takes a number of people and a lot of effort to make sure it's working properly and safely. So if you don't need to do it, uh, you could probably move a lot faster without it. But we definitely needed this guy. And I'll, um, yeah, I'll mention that uh, on the next slide. But yeah, I'll just point out here that um, so uh, I, since I started at the company, have been working on a few different areas, but primarily on the insertion hardware of the robot. So basically the mechanism of the robot that's responsible for interfacing with the implant, like literally how does the robot grab each thread of electrodes from the implant, insert it into the brain, make sure it stays inserted and doesn't, st like, doesn't stick to the robot and then go back and get the next thread and so on. But there are also a lot of other components on the robot um, that are essential for it to work and we'll talk about that too. So here in the images uh, on the left, you can see someone holding a model of an implant and those little silvery stringy things towards the bottom of the image, each one of those is one thread of electrodes. And uh, every thread has like 16 electrodes. Uh, correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's it, yeah. And uh, so each one of these threads has you know 16 electrodes and we want these electrodes to be targeted into the cortex, which is the outer layer of the brain, which has the neuron signals that we're trying to listen to. Um, but you know, one of the tricks is that uh, we want these threads to be as uh, as soft as we can so that they can um, match as closely as we can the stiffness of the brain. So you don't have like one super stiff needle next to super soft brain that, you know, with as the, as the heart pumps and as you breathe and there's micro motions in the brain, if you have a really soft thing next to a really stiff thing, maybe you end up damaging the brain. Um, so we want to optimize these threads to be really flexible. But then at the same time, how do you stick them in the brain if they're really flexible? And how do you do this really quickly? And then how do you avoid um, the vasculature, which is what we want to do to help minimize the damage to, um, to the neurons that we're trying to listen to. So in the image of the, on the right, you can see what the desired end state is. So on the left, we have the implant as manufactured. And then on the right, we have the ideal of like, we have each of these threads inserted into a brain. They're inserted around blood vessels so that we don't induce um, like immune response and glial scarring around the threads that would make the neurons we're listening to effectively further away from each electrode on the thread and make it harder for us to pick up signals. So we need to really carefully insert each of these threads to a precise depth um, quickly during surgery because uh, the, the shorter the surgery is, then it's, uh, it's safer. And then it also allows us to reduce costs and um, all these good things. And uh, yeah, and also at the same time, the brain is moving. <laughs> As I mentioned, you're breathing, um, the heart's pumping. Um, and so when you pick a target on the surface of the brain, to avoid these blood vessels, you have to be really careful that your target didn't suddenly move over uh, uh, over a blood vessel in the time between when you picked it and when you insert it. So these are some of the challenges that we worked on, and some of the basically those are the reasons why we determined we need a robot. Because if you had a person try to manually grab each one of these threads and stick it in with a needle, it would be pretty slow. They would have to be really careful not to hit the blood vessels. Um, yeah, they might rip the threads on accident just because they're so tiny and delicate. Uh, although our surgeon, Giants, is very good. I'm sure he wouldn't rip it. <laughs> um, and then we it's also a want- It's the size of a human hair, right? <laughs> yeah, but, but your skills are just incredible. <laughs> um, we also want to minimize the footprint uh, of the actual surgery. So each of these threads we insert into the brain, but um, as you can imagine that Puck implant, uh, like the body of the implant has to be somewhere on near the burr hole we're inserting into while the robot is inserting these threads. And by having a, a robotic surgery, we can help optimize the, um, the spaces of where uh, all these pieces fit together for surgery to have a minimally invasive as we can do. So here's uh, basically how we solved this problem. So on the top, the top image, you can see uh, basically the three stages of the surgery. So first the skin flap gets pulled back and then the uh, burr hole is made, basically drilled through the bone and exposing the brain. 
and then the robot can sew the threads from the implant that's mounted right adjacent to the burr hole, sew those threads into the brain. And then finally, that little puck, the implant gets put into the hole that was drilled and the skin flap sewn over it. And um, it's totally subcutaneous and wireless and no one would know that you had it just by looking at you. And so the way that the robot in the middle picture, the way that it actually accomplishes that is first, every thread of electrodes is a, um, arrayed on a piece of silicon and presented to the robot. Yeah, so you can see where the cursor is. Um, and the tip of each one of those threads has a little tiny loop. And the width of that loop is on the order of like 10 microns. And so we have to, with the robot, drive uh, the cannula, which in the bottom image, you can see the labeling, what's the thread and what's the cannula also. But yeah, that cannula is controlled by the robot and the robot moves that cannula over a thread. And then there's a needle inside that cannula that pierces this, the hole in the loop and the cannula and the needle work together to basically capture the thread. And then the robot peels it off the silicon backing. And then the robot drives it to the brain surface where it has targets placed and ready to insert each thread while avoiding vessels as shown in the bottom right image. Um, yeah, this is pretty challenging, uh, as I mentioned before, for, for a human, and we had to solve these problems for a robot. The threads are super tiny. We have to move with micron precision, and we have to make sure we hold on to each thread tightly enough that we peel it off, uh, but not you know so robustly that we can't get it to stay in the brain, which is super soft and doesn't have that much. Um, it's really easy to pull each thread out of the brain, I'll say that. And then the brain is also moving around this whole time, and the burr hole can be different depths um, between patients and the brain, which is super soft, is covered by layers of meninges, uh, which are much stiffer. So it's kind of like, uh, imagine you had a jello brain, and then you had like a bed sheet over it, and you're trying to stab a pen into the jello. And uh, in a lot of cases, the pen might just like dimple the sheet into the jello. But what we want to do is penetrate the jello with like minimum displacement and minimum damage. So this is some of the uh, mechanical engineering problems that we have to address. And in addition to all this uh, mechanical engineering, there's also you know software and optics. And um, if you guys know anyone good, I'll do my recruiting plug now. <laughs> uh, send them over. Cool, so in order to achieve that function that I showed on the last slide, this is the robot that we came up with. Uh, the primary components here, one is the needle, which is housed in the cannula, which is attached at the tip of where Giant's putting the cursor now. Um, and that you can't see the actual cannula in that image, but it would be at the bottom of that long stem. And the needle is actuated from, uh, the, uh, from up top above that metal triangular piece. And that, um, that whole piece can be removed and replaced for every surgery. And what's not shown in this image is the importance of sterility. Um, oh, I see Jeff has a question also about how do we prevent and minimize the risk of, in, of infection and rejection when doing implants? So this is probably a good question for Giant, but I can say on the robot side, um, basically anything that touches the patient or enters the sterile field needs to be sterile. And so uh, the needle cartridge that I was talking about, that part is designed to be removed from the robot and be able to be placed onto the robot all while uh, on the outside of a sterile shroud, basically. Um, oh yeah, so some of the images we saw in the, in the previous slide, uh, we only got those images because we have basically microscope optics. So for reference, the diameter of that cannula is 150 microns. And I mentioned the loop, the inner width of the loop is like 10 microns on the order of that. And so this is uh, pretty zoomed in and they have to, everything has to be precision aligned, pointing at this, all pointing at the needle tip. If we swap needles, it all has to point to the same thing. Um, so that's part of the fun challenges for us. And then the robot itself moves with micron precision and this whole operation can be done within the sterile field. Awesome, thank you, Christine. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Kate. I actually spent my first two and a half years at Neuralink working on the tiny needle that Christine was talking about. Um, just real quick, can everyone hear me okay? 
Yep. Okay. Awesome. Cool. So uh, Christine talked about the tiny needle and those tiny threads that are implanted into the brain. Um, each one of those threads is, yeah, actually about half the diameter of one of my pieces of hair. Um, and now I am going to talk about some of the hardware that I work on now, and that is um, the technology that is connected to those tiny threads and then what you can do with it. So the implant, including the threads, is what we call the N1 link. So if you hear me using that terminology, um, referring to this thing that you can see someone is holding with their hand, um, and it's about the size of a quarter. And as Christine explained, it'll fit into just a small hole in the skull. So it was actually feedback from people who are living with motor impairment who told us that it's high priority that the implant doesn't change their appearance, which led us to do a full redesign of the N1 system in January of 2020 to make it completely implanted. So on chip spike detection in that tiny implant allows it to be low power um, and have fast data processing. The link also uses Bluetooth for wireless communication to devices. Um, that are controlled by the neural signals collected on those 1,024 channels or electrodes. Cool, so that implant is powered by a rechargeable battery. And because the implant is fully enclosed under the skin, the battery needs to be charged wirelessly. So we use inductive charging through the skin. So some of you might be able to wirelessly charge your smartphones or other devices. And this is very similar technology. We are currently designing a fashionable way for users to charge their implants. So pictured here are two members of our consumer advisory board, which I'll talk about later, uh, testing out our charger prototypes, which are hats. Um, we're also designing hair clips, wheelchair mounts, and bed frame mounts. So when we get to the discussion portion of the presentation, we welcome any suggestions you have for other ways to wear your wireless charger. Okay, so this technology is really cool and really small, but what's it going to do? So right now, our rhesus macaques, um, including Pager, who you'll see in this video, use their brain implants to control cursors on screens to play games like Pong and Grid. So they each have two implants, one in each hemisphere. Um, so the two implants with 1,024 electrodes each means a total of 2,048 electrodes. So here's Pager using those implants to play grid, where he moves a cursor to a target to get a banana smoothie. Uh, Pager is using the joystick in this video out of habit, but the joystick is actually unplugged. Um, and it is actually his neural signals that are used to control the cursor. So this video is on YouTube and you can go there anytime and see it for yourself. And then you can see here that when Pager plays um, his favorite video game, which is Pong, he has learned that he doesn't need the joystick at all. So Pager is using the part of his brain that is connected to his right hand uh, and he's reaching up and down and that's, that's what uh, we're able to decode to allow him to move the joystick. Yeah, so like Giant said, Pages implants decode his um, intended hand movements. So when he thinks about moving his hand, the um, electrodes in the N1 sense that, and then those signals are de decoded to control the cursor on the screen. And this is entirely possible in humans, um, as long as your motor cortex is intact. So even if those signals from your brain, when you think about moving your hand, can't necessarily tell your hand to move, you can still think about moving your hand. Um, so we bypass that connection, like Giant explained earlier, um, from the brain to the muscle, and instead take the signal directly from the brain to control something else, such as a cursor on the screen. So you saw in this video that's playing now um, that you would just think about moving your hand in order to calibrate the device and then control it. 
Cool. So just as Pager can control a cursor in the grid game, uh, you can see how this would translate to humans and how they could use those same electrodes and decoding algorithms to control a cursor on the screen of a computer or smartphone or tablet. So that is the goal of the N1, which will give people the ability to control computers, smartphones, or tablets directly using their neur neural signals. So this will allow for communication through technology, such as speech generating devices. Uh, as long as it can be controlled by a computer, a smartphone, or tablet app, it can be controlled with the N1. So this opens the door for a lot of other technologies to make, or a lot of other innovators to make accessible technology and solutions that can be controlled via brain machine interface. So for example, to make a wheelchair that can be controlled by the brain, someone wouldn't have to build the brain machine interface anymore. They would just have to make an app to control the wheelchair, and then that app could be controlled by the and one, so boom, allow other people to make brain machine interfaces without having to worry about the hard brain interface part. <laughs> so at Neuralink, we know how important it is to engage with people that will benefit most from these first devices. Um, you might recognize the guy in the middle of the photo on the top right. Um, so that's Steve Gleason. And when Steve visited Neuralink in 2019, we were still, yeah, that small team trying to overcome just the engineering challenges and creating high bandwidth and planable BMI. And we didn't yet have our first product goal. And he said to the team via his eye tracker and speech generating device, I would give up half the time I have left on earth if I could communicate at a conversational speed. And this st statement and sentiment has truly driven our goal to provide people with the means to communicate with the world at a faster rate. So when I think about our goals for bitrate or speed, I think that this is for Steve and for people like him. It was also Team Gleason that showed us the frustrations of eye tracker calibration and inspired our goals to make calibration quick and easy. So then our awesome engineering team has designed a calibration um, that happens continuously as you use the device. So you would only need to calibrate it if you don't use it for several days in a row. So also pictured here on the bottom is a panel discussion um, that we did with our consumer advisory board back in December. Um, and our consumer advisory board is five people who are living with quadriplegia and they are part of our team and they advise us on designs that affect user experience. Um, you can also see Justin and Christine, um, different Christine, modeling some more of the <laughs> charger hat prototypes like we talked about earlier. So that's them, yeah, engaging and giving us feedback on our designs. So we are engaging with people on how to make our technology now. And we also want feedback from the community on where to take the technology next. So beyond the control of computers, smartphones, and tablets, what else would you want a brain machine interface to do for you or your loved ones? And with that in mind, we want to thank you for your time and open the floor for discussion. Um, so please ask us any questions or tell us your thoughts on where to go next with BMI. All right, thank you guys. That was that was really, I loved, I loved the demonstrations and I now want a monkey, so. Thank you for showing us that. These they so are great. Cute. Oh, also a great thing about our monkeys is they will hold your hand. So oh. when I'm having a bad day at work, um, Pager will hold my hand for the price of a grape. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so sweet. Okay, well, um, we have we have some um, of our students that are here to moderate the question. So um, Zoe and, and Aiden. Hi everyone, um, most of you know me, but because I've done this before, but my name is Zoe. Um, I joined Everything ALS because uh, I'm super passionate about helping ALS patients in any way that I can. Um, and mainly because I have a firsthand experience because my father was diagnosed with ALS in 2017. And um, like anyone else that's personally affected with ALS, um, ALS has become my mission and um, helping ALS patients with anything and everything to improve their quality of life and move the needle towards a cure has become my mission. So um, technology is a huge hope for so many ALS patients and it fills the gaps where medicine is lacking right now. So I have so much faith in the world of technology 
to do that for people. And um, so if Aiden wants to introduce himself real quick. Yeah, my name is Aiden. I'm a current student ambassador at Everything ALS and I'm the son of Hindu. Um, I'm a current uh, student ambassador, junior at USC. And um, I, I don't know, my stepdad uh, was affected by ALS and I now I'm uh, working to change neurodegenerative diseases as a whole. And I wanna be passionate about that and changing technology in any way I can. So first we have some participant questions if you wanted to start Zoe. Yeah, so one question that one of our participants was wondering about was um, what exactly will hold the thread in place once it's inserted into the brain? Uh, I can try to answer that. Let me know if this doesn't quite answer your question. But once the before the thread's inserted into the brain, it's um, attached to the silicon substrate, and then the robot grabs it and peels it off. And at this point, the thread is attached to the implant on one end, and it's being gripped by the robot at the loop at the the other end of the thread that has the loop on it. And so um, the needle is going through the loop and that's how it's gripping the thread. And once the needle inserts the thread into the brain, the needle retracts and the thread just uh, is left in place in the brain. So uh, I guess you could say that there's, there's nothing really holding it in the brain, but there's no loads trying to pull the thread out of the brain at that point. Awesome. So our next question, oh yeah, the comment on your office background is very cool as well. Um, the next question was asking, uh, what prevents the monkey uh, pager from removing the implant once it's set in? Yeah, so pager can't um, remove his implant. It is enclosed under um, the skin. There's like, he would, yeah, have to tear his scalp off, which I don't think he really has a desire to do. Um, as far as we can tell, he also can't feel it. He doesn't really notice that it's there. Um, they okay. resume their normal habits and like grooming habits and everything like that. Um, in that video, his hair hadn't fully grown back, but um, now you really can't tell. So when I try to charge him, like I have no idea where his implant is. <laughs> awesome. Another important follow-up to that uh, quickly, Zoe, is that um, sure. we've designed the device to be completely explantable too. So uh, at any point in time that it's no longer uh, no longer desirable to have or upgraded, uh, where where the intent is that it can be taken out completely and a, and a new one installed. Right. That's that's super important. Um, another question that came up was. Um, whether the monkeys or a pager was ha were having seizures um, with the device implanted? No. No seizures. Yeah, we're, we're definitely looking for all types of uh, medical complications associated with surgery. Um, it's, it's so, uh, it, is a, it is a risk that we're, we're looking to, to see if we cause it, but uh, so far we haven't. And uh, the procedure itself, because it's done with these really small uh, implants and done so finely with the robot, we think the amount of damage is so low that the chances of a seizure occurring are, are very low. That's great to hear. And in addition to our wonderful neurosurgeons, we also have wonderful um, veterinarians and RVTs who are around 24 um, seven monitoring the animals and making sure they're all good. Awesome. So our next question is, is this is a long one, is the motor co cortex the only viable implantation location? Is, and is it required for the neurons at that site to be healthy and functioning normally? My understanding is that in advanced ALS, the cell death often propagates back to the motor cortex. That's a, a great question, and the the answer is uh, no. Uh, you don't have to implant it just within the motor cortex. Um, uh, people are already experimenting with other parts of the of the motor cortex to decode the same motor intention. Uh, but I think the the really interesting part of this is that um, uh, any part of your brain that has conscious control can be used as a uh, as a way to control a brain-machine interface. So 
If you don't have a hand area, but you have a leg area, you could use your legs. If you wanted to use speech because the motor cortex was, uh, was gone, but you had the motor, you have the conscious control over speech, you could use speech to control the movement of a joystick. So you can take any input uh, or any output of your brain and map it to any input uh, into a machine. So it doesn't have to be thinking about moving a cursor. It could be just thinking of a certain word or a phrase that would that could be the control for a, for a machine. That's super interesting. Um, this is actually a follow-up to that question. Um, so one of the participants wants to know how you decide which neurons to read specifically, and even if it's not as it pertains to controlling devices, um, just generally how to how to decide out of the 100 billion neurons there are in the brain, uh, which ones to target. Yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, a really great question. So since the around um, 1950s, we've been doing uh, a brain surgery for patients that have tumors uh, or other, other kinds of problems in and around the motor neurons. And we've mapped the areas by carefully touching the surface of the brain and, and transmitting a small electrical signal through it, uh, sometimes back then with patients awake. And now we can do that with patients asleep where we put uh, small listening uh, devices on the, uh, on the muscles that we're interested in, in mapping. And we can stimulate different parts of that motor cortex or different parts of the cortex and tell exactly what part of the body they influence. And so uh, we can uh, target the brain in the operating room that way. But now we can do this even before the operation uh, by putting a patient inside a magnetic uh, resonance imaging uh, tube, an MRI tube. We can tell based on uh, what someone's intended movement. So you can take someone who's paralyzed and do this and have them think of a certain conscious task, say move your arm or think of speech. And the part of your brain that's responsible for a lot of that uh, conscious action will, will show up on that image. And we can use that image even before the surgery to help us uh, fine tune where we would place the, the implant for an individual person. So we can actually really tune it to the individual person. It's not everyone's map is not the same. That's great. That answered my question about uh, individual mapping as well, about um, varying brains and how, how do you target that. Um, but another participant had a question about how close are you to having a human move a mouse freely with the N1? And I actually explored this further um, myself when I did my own research, uh, and I wanted to know when you say users would control with the neural link, is it measured by neural activity in certain parts of the brain? And is this similar to a behavioral maze test for mice? Um, so I, I think the, the first part of that um, about uh, when, when, a, when is a patient control, a human uh, patient been able to control a, a mouse with the N1. No one has done that yet with the N1. We're working towards our first clinical trial to establish safety. Uh, but we feel uh, confident that we'll be able to do this because brain-machine interfaces in this exact location um, have been under uh, experimentation with humans uh, for over 10 years now. And, uh, and there's one individual that has uh, those devices are implanted uh, with kind of a piston that pushes uh, a set of electrodes into the brain rather bluntly. Uh, that does cause some amount of bleeding, but they're able to record this, exactly the same uh, areas that you saw that were recording in pager and, and able to have uh, human participants control uh, um, mice. They're able to, uh, as of a few weeks ago, decode uh, if you wanted to write, let's say, a letter in, in, in space, they can decode the letter uh, and, and they can do increased typing speed with those. Uh, they've been able to control robotic limbs uh, there's one woman who controlled a flight simulator, record, be able to control an airplane in a flight simulator after a few, uh, just a few hours of training on it and playing with it. So um, uh, that was the first part of your question. Um, the, the second part was, Ed, could you remind me again, Aiden? Oh, just about the virtual mouse on your website, you explained about um, how like a, the users would be able to control a virtual mouse with Neuralink. Is it measured by neural activity in certain parts of the brain? 
And is this similar to a behavioral maze test for mice? Uh, Kate, do you want to do you want to take that one, or Christine? Christine, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, could you repeat the question? Sure. <laughs> um, uh, it's really no, no. I know it's, uh, it's so about the virtual mouse in that users would control with the neural link. Is it measured by certain parts of the brain with neural activity, and is it similar to behavioral maze tests for mice? So I'm not super familiar with the behavioral maze test for mice. Okay, so <laughs> I guess it would be something different um, with the virtual mouse. I, th I think take a crack at. Uh, yeah, do you want to try, Kate, or? Oh no, that's fine. I'm also not super familiar with that. Yeah, and and we can yeah. send some of these questions later, and we can answer them right. later. Yeah. Fine. The, the, right. the maze test is is a, a spatial awareness test uh, in in mice. Uh, we're we're doing e even smaller part of that. So just uh, moving left, right, up, and down, we're able to decode that. Um, so it would be the similar population of neurons in a, in a mouse, uh, but for a different task. Got it. Thank you. So the next question is as it pertains to uh, current eye tracking systems that most ALS patients use for communication and how a device such as the, um, the Neuralink would expand the abilities of eye tracking systems that exist currently. Sure. Um, yeah, I can take a stab at this one and if you guys want to follow up. Um, so with um, eye tracking, we're hopeful that it could um, sort of replace this kind of technology so that right now with eye tracking, you have to rely on the same function that you use. So your eyes you're using right to look around to do other things. Um, and then you have to duplicate, you have to use that same function to control the cursor on the screen. Um, so instead of doing that, we would free up your eyes to do what they're naturally doing, right? To look around, to blink, um, to do all their natural functions and instead utilize a different portion of the brain um, that you aren't using to control your limbs or something, um, use that to control the cursor on the screen. So that we that way, you know, you could look at something else or while you use your um, keyboard or mouse. And we're also hopeful that this will speed up that um, communication rate. So a lot of eye trackers rely on dwell time for things like click, whereas our technology uses actual click instead of dwell time. So you can do things like typing at a much faster rate. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank and you. Another advantage uh, with a brain machine interface is that you don't even need to look at anything to control it. Uh, all you need to do is think about the action that would be uh, connected to the thing you want to control and the way you'd want to control it. So if you wanted to think about moving your hands up, maybe you decide that turns all the lights on. Um, if you think about making a circle with your hand, maybe that turns the thermostat to the temperature you like. So you can do it with your eyes completely closed, uh, in bed, anywhere. It doesn't need to physically follow you in any way that, that current eye track or any kind of image-based uh, processing needs to do. And then eventually, as you get more used to the device and the device gets more used to you, um, you're no longer thinking about waving your arm. You're just thinking about turning off the light. So we think of it similar to um, when we type on a keyboard, right? We're not thinking about, oh, move our finger to this key and that key and this key. Uh, we are like the first couple of times we use the computer, but after that, right, you just think type the letter K. Um, so it'd be sort of similar to that. Likewise to um, issues with uh, sp spatial recognition, I wanted to know more about um, like how it would affect hearing and also how similar to a cochlear implant for hearing loss is the N1 implant. So uh, since we're, uh, so the brain is all about, um, uh, these parts of your brain is all about location. Um, so the, the parts of the brain that we're, we're uh, first trying to, um, uh, to implant are those that are principally responsible for the movement of the hand. So uh, it, 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 there's, 
um, very little influence uh, uh, that can be, uh, there's no influence that can be detected on, on the recognition of speech or the processing of, of hearing. Uh, so uh, based on human experiments and also operating on this area for hundreds of years on, on people that there is, there's, shouldn't affect your, your, your hearing at all. Uh, but you bring up a really interesting question about cochlear implants. And so I think it's important because brain machine interfaces are already here. What we're talking about is not, uh, never, it's, ne it's not that it's never been done, not even in a, in a experimental sense. Uh, those, those uh, neuro, it's mounted on the skull, just like, uh, like a cochlear implant. There are electrodes going into the, and touching the nervous system, just like a cochlear implant. And it's all underneath the skin, battery power, just like a cochlear implant. And, and so uh, it, it, the, the work that we're doing is really, really similar to that. Uh, it, it, we're improving on that uh, because uh, we're, we're able to put many more listening um, electrodes within the brain and we're able to do it much more safely and quickly. That's the other really important part is that uh, the procedure itself should take a uh, very little amount of time. And the hope is that it's something that would be so quick to do and so safe to do that it would be uh, something that would be kind of a, a one day get in the, get in, in the morning and, and leave that afternoon with uh, a really safe neurosurgery, which is also possible to do already, but that we're delivering uh, to, to this technology so that it's something that, that people will actually get. Awesome. Um, the next question is as it pertains to the risk of um, this device. And I know you discussed about the modifications that help to mitigate the risks, uh, either whether, whether it regards to the surgery or just the, the electrodes causing brain damage or nerve damage. But what, uh, what risks do remain? Um, and one of the participants were wondering specifically as it pertains to whether it's hitting your head in the surgical area, whether that would cause inflammation or um, situations that would cause uh, brain damage with this implant. Yeah, it's a, a, a really important question. Um, and uh, one I need to, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a physician first, uh, but I also wanna make everyone uh, understand that I, I am also an employee of Neuralink and so I have a conflict of interest when you when you hear these things, not to say that uh, uh, there, there might be some subconscious uh, part of that, but I, I think it's important for physicians to say this anytime they're participating in any study, and so I want to make sure I'm transparent about that. Um, and so uh, that being said, if we look at the, the history of, of implantable devices in the brain uh, for, for many years, uh, things like deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's or tremor or OCD, those go very deep in the brain. The risk of, uh, say, a hemorrhage uh, is around 1%. Uh, uh, the risk of infection is just like any uh, brain operation is around 4%. Uh, that, and that's with taking uh, in a sterile operating room, sterile technique with antibiotics. That's uh, a kind of a global average. Uh, it goes up when you're doing operations for uh, uh, trauma or accidents, but uh, for, for this type of procedure, it should be very low. Almost all infection rates have to do with the amount of time that you're under anesthesia, so how long the procedure takes. Uh, one of the advantages that we're trying to deliver is with the surgical approach to speed that up significantly. So the, the idea is the risk of infection goes down, but we haven't established that yet. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, how safe is it to, to have one of these in your head? Um, uh, the, uh, we're, that's what the first experiment is really going to examine and be the primary endpoint for. But if we look at the other, other implant, so the other implant right now is called the Black Rock or Utah Array. That's the ones you'll see in, on YouTube. Uh, there is a, uh, a device that comes out of the skull and sits there, and it's a, a wound that's open all the time. Uh, so there's a perpetual risk of infection there. Um, and despite all that, and, and this is only about 48 patients experienced, there have been uh, zero deaths. That's, that's important. I feel like it's important to talk about that because it is, it is an operation just like getting a knee operation. It's, it is a, it's a procedure uh, or, or a you know, plastic surgery operation. So it's like, it's like one of those. 
Um, but uh, the so there's a, a, I think one person had an infection that required uh, the device to be removed in those in those 48. No one had a traumatic injury associated with it. Uh, and we're doing we're doing testing because we want this to be a real world device because those those folks have to come to a lab to have it physically connected. Uh, our goal is to have it in your home uh, or anywhere you go. And and so we're putting it through its paces in terms of uh, physical stra strains that it might undergo, uh, but there, uh, so it's, it's uh, not established yet, but we're designing it with all those things in consideration. So being around electrical fields, the potential for traumatic injury, like a fall, uh, being able to make sure the device is, is uh, safe uh, to do those things. But uh, based on the current you know, deep brain stimulation and all these other implants, cochlear device implants, uh, we expect the risk to be uh, the same. And I'll add, just in case there's confusion about this, but the implant itself is not just like floating on the brain, but it's fixed to the skull. Um, so it's not like you would just, you know, tap it and it will push on your brain. Yeah, and there are um, very detailed FDA guidelines on the type of testing that we do to make sure that it is safe if, like you had the example, if you get hit on the head. Um, that you know you wouldn't have something hit you on the head and then it gets pushed into your brain or it shatters in your skull or something like we are very very cautiously testing all of this um, to the point where we're even dropping very heavy metal balls onto the charger to make sure that even then it wouldn't cause harm to the patient other than the heavy metal ball. That's great to hear that there's minimal risks involved and um, another question was what is the life cycle of the chip and for example, how long would it have to be, before it would have to be replaced? And how frequently must it, the device be charged? Yeah, so these are definitely excellent questions. Um, for the first investigational device exemption, so that's the IDE that we're working toward right now for those first um, clinical trial patients, we are um, guaranteeing like one year um, and then after that one year, like we're hoping that it still works. Um, there's not, the thing about, yeah, longevity is you have to test it for, right? If you're gonna guarantee it's gonna work for 10 years, it has to actually have been tested for 10 years. Um, we were doing a lot of things like accelerated lifetime testing, but um, yeah, so that first device that will go to clinical trials, um, it will last for a, one year at least. Um, for the product that will go out to a broader population, we are obviously working to extend that, um, but I can't really give too much more guarantee um, for how often it will have to be charged. Um, we're also constantly working to make it more and more low power. Uh, we have a lot of things going on right now so that, yeah, it can be, so it won't have to be charged um, as often, but yeah, this is also something that, you know, we want to hear from the community is what, like, what would you expect? What are, what would it take for you to have to get, um, the device? Is it something like it would have to last 10 years before, you know, you need a replacement? Is it something where, you know, you'd only charge it like every other day? Um, you will be able to use the device while it's charging, but, um, so yeah, similar to your iPhone and also the charger is wireless. Should have mentioned that so you won't have to be tethered to anything to charge it you just walk around or move around with your hat on that's awesome thank you for that um the next question is in regards to um, motor function and restoring motor function in neurodegenerative patients um as it pertains to als there is significant motor neuron damage that occurs throughout the disease progression and um, some of the patients were wondering if um, bringing back motor function is plausible, given that um, how, would you, how would you send a signal to a motor neuron that's sustained significant damage? Yeah, so this is a, a really important question that gets to the, the differences between the types of uh, applications and, and, and and people were hoping to help. Um, 
just like you you said the the and I'm sure um, many of you know that the there's a there's a physical connection between a, a, a single nerve and a, and a group of muscle fibers. Um, the more muscle fibers that a single nerve controls, the more fine movement you get, and the more uh, the, the and, and so the con controls go like that and. They're actually pruned on a daily basis. Uh, you lose this and gain it all the time. So the whole use it, you lose, use it or lose it, or why I have back pain sitting all the time instead of getting up and walking around is from that. Um, but uh, so so if the nerve itself is degenerated, uh, then you can't you can't. Uh, there's no interface to the nerve itself. But uh, you can uh, through the skin stimulate the muscle itself. Uh, so uh, you can, uh, so these are experimental uh, right now, but people have connected brain machine interfaces to external wearables that uh, change uh, the movement of a wrist or close, open and closing a hand. And um, so you can, uh, can you, you can over, you can uh, kind of overcome the loss of a motor neuron. Uh, but what's challenging is if patients have loss of muscles themselves, so myopathies or uh, uh, muscular dystrophies, those types of diseases where the muscle itself goes away, that's uh, it's a separate problem. But I think what, what's important to think about uh, is uh, the fact that uh, you can still control whichever end effector you, you would want to use to control the limb. If, if limb function is what you want, you can control an exoskeleton that doesn't require any uh, intact nerve to motor connection at all, or you could use one of these muscle stimulators, uh, or you can connect it to a, 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 a nerve itself. Uh, if that's what's, uh, for, for example, in a spinal cord injury where the nerves through from the arm down to the hand are fine, uh, you can actually interface with those muscles themselves to control those, those nerves directly. In terms of the primary disease process, it's really important to think of brain-machine interfaces as a quality of life uh, tool, uh, similar to how a wheelchair is very important to help you get around, uh, but really has nothing to do with spinal cord injury or Parkinson's disease. It is enabling uh, a, an improvement of a quality of life. And so this, this falls into that same category. It is not a treatment for ALS, the primary conditions of ALS, but it is a possible tool that would, uh, uh, we hope, uh, because of how many things it could do potentially um, dramatically improve the quality of life of anyone with or without motor impairment, but mostly and firstly people with, with motor impairment. That's great to hear. Um, the next question is pertaining to FDA approvals. And we know as of 2020 that you guys have um, limited human testing, but do you have, how have these limitations affected uh, your research and do you guys have FDA approval for human trials yet? What is the timeline on that? Yeah, our, our first and uh, first and always will be first goal is safety. Um, this has to be really safe to get. It has to be really safe to keep. Uh, it has to be really safe to get replaced. And it has to be really safe to take it out. All of those things uh, take a lot of effort from a lot of really smart people like Kate and Christine that are doing that work to make sure that, that that's going to happen. So, uh, so we are right now in the very early process of that first step in terms of getting into humans. Um, we have to establish that it's doing all those things safely with uh, non-human participants first. And so we're doing all the same uh, experiments and trials with the same surgical setup and the same seriousness that we'll, we're bringing to the human trials with, with non-human participants to really establish that this is a safe step to take. Um, we're hoping to start that human trial as soon as possible and we're working really hard to get to a trial where we'll be able to invite uh, or, or hope to gain the participation of about 10 people to look at mostly the safety uh, of this device, which we think will not be um, any, any more risky than all the other technologies I talked about that have been around for many years, but also that we'll be able to demonstrate by working really closely with those individuals that uh, really put it through its paces because there's a whole lot more you can do with a human that can talk to you, with a caregiver that can communicate 
uh, than you can with uh, any sort of uh, non-human participant, right? You can't, you can't, you, what, what do you want to do today is not a question uh, we, can, we can easily uh, gain an answer to from our, our current um, animal participants. But with, with, with human teammates, uh, we really can learn a lot and move much more quickly. Uh, but we're we're it, we're along in the path, but we're uh, we're hoping to get there this year. Great, that sounds awesome. Um, so the next question is whether you think that Neuralink will ever reach a point where the interface won't just read the neurons, but will be able to um, write to them. And what applications do you think will come up from that? Yes, <laughs> uh, we're all we're all dreaming of all sorts of pretty amazing things in the future. Uh, that is definitely one of the the hopes for, um, and it's baby steps, right? So we gotta we gotta make sure it's safe. We have to make sure we're helping people with with this version to make sure people are getting value. And then there's a lot of, a lot of really amazing science going on now to, to address that other part of input. And once again, none of it is, none of it is new. There's a lot of it's not new. Uh, deep brain simulation is an input device that works really well uh, for, for, a certain, uh, for a certain challenge that people have. Um, if, same with uh, devices in the brain for seizures. Uh, for obsessive and compulsive disorder, Tourette syndrome, uh, that are being applied for depression. Uh, we think that our, our, our platform will be able to perform many of those same functions, uh, but we have to get there. Um, yeah, we'll get there. Awesome, so we have time for one more question. And this last question is pertaining to um, feedback reinforcement. So are there any plans to include feedback reinforcement loops through optical, haptic, or audible wearables that interface with the implant? That's a really awesome question. Uh, Kate or uh, Christine, any, any thoughts about that? I think it's a cool idea. Yeah, I guess it maybe depends what you want to control. Like if you're typing, uh, yeah, I guess you have pretty good visual feedback of what you're doing and can course correct that way. Um, but yeah, if you're doing something like using a robotic arm to pick up an egg, uh, you might want some proprioceptive feedback. And then do you want to do that via something haptics or, you know, we talked about potentially using the implant itself to stimulate neurons. Maybe you route it back to the brain directly. That's a, uh, yeah, definitely something on our radar. Just to clarify, um, I was also imagining where maybe computer vision uh, character recognition is much faster than telling something, no, that's not the right one and being able to self-feedback and select that way. There's so many different AI applications that are already there on cell phones that there's a, it seems like an untapped world. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. I think one of the most uh, interesting experiments I listened to recently about um, about brain machine interfaces too, actually. One was on, on that uh, uh, sentence completion, right? That was getting so good that my iPhone still suggests some pretty strange things for me to text, but uh, it's not quite there yet. But uh, I, I think, yeah, that's it's pretty amazing to think. It, so the, the recent experiment about uh, drawing letters actually was improved by using those, uh, those speech recognition, the, the, the statistical models for like, what, what word are you most likely trying to try to type? The other experiment that I thought was really fascinating was uh, a human machine collaboration with the brain machine interface controlling a wheelchair. So you use the, uh, so you use the human uh, brain to decide that's the direction I want to go. So define the, the main decision. And uh, instead of asking the human to make every small move to get there, it, there's a handoff to an autonomous uh, a system that does the kind of, um, you know, uh, 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 avoidance, uh, 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 um, object avoidance type things that like that you're talking about that do so well already about, hey, there's a step there, we're not going that way. Uh, so working together, they actually allowed uh, participants with that with that device to do um, much better control and get to their, their intended targets much more quickly. 
I, so I think there is a, there's this, yeah, there's a fantastic intersection between uh, how we interact with the tools in our environment that, uh, that brain machine interfaces are a part of, <clears throat> but that's a, a really cool idea. Yeah, this is very fascinating stuff, guys. And I wish we could talk forever because there's so many more questions. But um, just out of respect for your time, um, we were going to just conclude it right there. And we all wanted to, our entire Everything ALS family wanted to thank all three of you for your time and for this excellent presentation. Um, as you know, any step is a step in the right direction for ALS patients. And we're so appreciative to people like you who are, um, who are making things that will increase our, quality, our ALS patient quality of life incredibly. So thank you guys so much. Um, we look forward to speaking to you in the future. Um, and I will turn it over to, sorry, go ahead. And we hear Bill saying, thank you, Elon. So I guess. <laughs> we'll tell him. Yeah. Thanks for having us guys. It's, uh, it's an honor to, to be speaking with you and hear you guys' perspectives on things. Um, my dad had ALS as well, and uh, it's the organization that you have and the community is really inspiring. Oh, Thank wow. you I'm sorry. That. sorry to hear that. I did not know that, Christine. I, they said there was a connection that you had, um, but didn't say what, so I'm sorry, yeah. Um, but thank you guys, this is great. This is um, amazing and we had a great turnout and this will be recorded. So if you wanna go back and listen to it again, like we often do, cause there's so many great questions and so much great information, but our CEO and founder of Everything ALS, Indu, um, you wanna say, hi, I know you were helping out in the beginning, but you've- Yeah, <laughs> well, thank you very much. You know, this is such a, you know, our organization is built on bringing technology innovations to ALS. That's our mission. And each one of us in our organization have been affected by ALS. Um, we are some people who are living with their loved ones with ALS or some of us who lost our loved ones to ALS. So this organization is um, kind of in the honor of our loved ones. We've come together to bring technology innovations. And uh, um, so thank you very much for doing this, what you're doing and also being here. We really appreciate it. And we call June our, uh, brain computer interface month so we'll be talking about this a lot this month thank you so thank much you. for having us yeah thank you uh zoe and and uh aiden for for in involving us today we're happy to uh, come back anytime and uh even if you'd like to have a separate uh, question and answer or whatever i'd, I'd be happy to to join and and, and uh, participate and, and, and hear more, uh, really for me to hear more of uh, what your community wants, um, you know, not even, not even about ALS, but I think uh, listening to uh, uh, all of you that have been affected by it, caregivers also, I think there is, a, it's really important that we look at all of the, yeah, all of everyone's experience and make sure that we're paying attention to that. So. Um, please, any time that we can, yeah, come back and and talk. Please let us know for yeah, any any time. Thank you, John, for Thank that you. opportunity because that's something that community has been asking is to give feedback about you know what are some of the things that's hard on a day to day basis or what would they like to see out there. So I think that was that's something we would love to take up on that offer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We've been doing um, focus group discussions with people living with quadriplegia due to spinal cord injury, um, since that's our target population for that first IDE. Um, and we would love to start extending this to the ALS community and sort of having just like discussions to really yeah, get the input from you guys on what you want and what you need. Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, we can definitely help be the connection for that because we have um, a lot of people living with ALS on our platform that are involved all the time. So Bring in your feedback, everybody, and your comments, and we can help share that. Thank you. And um, as a next uh, session, what we do, I mean, you don't have to stay. We actually open it up for everybody to just speak up and, you know, connect with each other. So, but we do appreciate your time and uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Have a great evening. Thank you all. Thank you. There you have it, folks. Another in your home 
consultation by these fine folks who have dedicated their lives to making our lives a lot better. 